We are in our fifth and final week of our series called Flying Through Philemon. And the title of tonight's message is Paul's Confidence and Yours. Paul's Confidence and Yours. Where do you find confidence in the midst of life's most difficult situations? Where do you turn for confidence when life gets rough? Because as we have seen, the Apostle Paul is in an exceedingly difficult situation with this man named Onesimus. And it's very awkward, it's very troubling for Onesimus and Philemon and the Apostle Paul. And it's incredibly difficult. But yet, this text says that the Apostle Paul is able to find confidence. But where does he find confidence? Where does he draw his confidence from? And that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. There are three primary things that Paul draws confidence from. Now, this is only two weeks old now, but I've been reaching out to some of the youth students to put themselves into the slideshow here. Joel lovingly did the slide for last week. I don't know where he went. There he is. But we've only been doing these for two weeks, and they're only getting more and more ridiculous over the course of these two weeks. So I'm glad we're coming to a halt here for a month. But Caitlin was so gracious to be able to hold up a three because we've got three confidence boosters that we're going to be talking about this week. And I reached out to Caitlin and asked her to take a picture of herself with a three of some sort. And this is what she produced. <laughs> Again, there's a lot going on in this photo here. But you've got like some brand class, cl clashage down here with Starbucks, with Culver's, and you've got an interesting costume. I think she's going to fly away here with the cape as well. But she could not be here this evening, much to her chagrin. But give Caitlin a shout out tonight. Tell her we're thinking about her. Because we've got three confidence boosters that we'll be looking at this evening. And before we jump into what the first confidence booster is, I would like to read the text that we're going to be looking at tonight from Philemon. We're going to be starting in verse 17 and going through to the end of the book. Verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So the first confidence booster that I'd like to look at is as follows. The first place that Paul finds confidence in the midst of this awkward and difficult situation is Philemon himself. It's Philemon that boosts his confidence. All three of these boosters, if you will, they start with the letter P. P. So the first confidence booster is Philemon. Look with me now to verse 21, what Paul says about him. He says, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. In other words, friends, Philemon was a great follower of Jesus Christ who Paul could trust with his life. Even in the midst of this difficult and awkward situation with Onesimus. Onesimus has wronged him, maybe stolen from him, and yet Paul makes this difficult request of him and Paul says, I know you will honor my request because your faith and your reputation as a follower of Jesus precedes you. 
He says, I know you will not only listen to me, but you will be obedient to my command. And not only will you be obedient to my command, he says, but in the second half of the verse, he says, I know that you will do even more than I say. You will treat Onesimus even better than you did before. Because that's how awesome of a follower of Jesus Christ that you are. And I wonder if that is true of you tonight. Do you just try to do the bare minimum that people ask of you? Or do you try to go above and beyond what people ask of you? Because you know that you are not ultimately serving man and their expectations of you, but ultimately you are serving Jesus Christ and you want to honor him with your life and your service. Do you go above and beyond in your job description? Whatever it is. For many of you, your job description is to be a student, to be a friend, to be a son, and to be a daughter. How are you doing in those regards? Are you just meeting the bare minimum? Are you just skating by? Or are you like Philemon, eager to go above and beyond? Because if you just want to skate by in life and do the bare minimum, you're basically like a husband who says to his wife, what's the bare minimum that I have to do with you in order to not get divorced? How fruitful of a marriage is that going to be, friends? It's not. We are called to go above and beyond in our service to others and to Jesus Christ, regardless of People are even watching you or not. My dad used to tell me that integrity is who you are when no one is watching. Who are you when no one's watching? Do you shirk responsibilities? Shirk duties when nobody's really asking anything of you? Or do you go above and beyond your job description? Christians are called to do the latter, not the former. The book of Ephesians says this, slaves, employees, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, that's kind of what this institution of slavery meant for the Apostle Paul in his context. He said, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, But as slaves of Christ, again, it's who you're serving ultimately. As slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. So if you're in the work world right now, or you will be in the work world maybe this summer when you get a job, and you have a boss, or somebody who's over you and gives commands and instructions to you. Your job is to work for that person exactly as you would work for Jesus Christ himself. Unless that person asks you to sin or do something obviously against biblical commands, your job is to obey that person and to submit to that person and to work hard for that person and go above and beyond for that person because it is ultimately Christ that you are serving. See through the person to your Lord, ultimately. That's how you will be a good worker for Jesus Christ. Do you guys remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Maybe some of y'all have read his narrative. It's in Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 50. I commend that story to you to go back and read at home. But long story short, Joseph was sold to Ishmaelite spice traders and was brought to Egypt, basically as a slave, and was bought by this man named Potiphar, who was one of Pharaoh's highest officials. He was the captain of his military guard at the time. And because God was with Joseph, the Lord blessed everything that Joseph did and touched. 
And in this narrative, in the book of Genesis, we see something incredible. In Genesis chapter 39, it says that from the time Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Because the only thing that Potiphar could do in regards to food is he could eat it himself. Joseph couldn't eat Potiphar's food for him. That's the only thing that Potiphar couldn't do. But Joseph did everything else. And as you work at your various jobs, whatever it is, or even being a son or daughter to your parents, when they go away for the weekend, do they trust you enough to be the man or the woman of the household when they're gone? Because that's what Christians should be. Or if you do work at Culver's and you work the fry station at Culver's, for instance, and your boss leaves you, can he trust you to be head over the fries and leave everything in your charge and in your care and not lose one wink of sleep over it? That should characterize a Christian life. We should be trustworthy, just like Philemon was, to go above and beyond his job description. Because, as Scripture tells us, the greater Joseph... And the greater Philemon, Jesus Christ, was trustworthy in the work that his father had given him to do. In John chapter 5, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, the son, talking about himself, S-O-N, not S-U-N, the son, me, can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. Whatever I see my commander-in-chief doing, that I also do. And I don't even bat an eyelash. His obedience to his father was automatic. Take that to the bank. And your obedience to the people that are in authority over you should be automatic. And you should do above and beyond even what they ask of you in the end. So, That's the first thing. Philemon, that's his first confidence booster. These next two are quicker, I promise. Booster number two is prayer. It's prayer. That's what gives confidence in the midst of this difficult and trying situation. Let's read verse 22. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. (laughs) What? Seems really out of place in the rest of the story. Is it? At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will graciously be given to you. In other words, the apostle Paul wanted to stay with Philemon and visit him and refresh him and be refreshed by being in his company. That's how much he loved him. He didn't just give commands and say, obey me because I'm an apostle and I have authority over you. No, no, no. He wanted to do life with Philemon. Rules without a relationship equals rebellion. But rules with a relationship equals response. We see just how loving Paul is in his address to Philemon. I'm not just going to give you a command, but I'm going to do life with you too. That's how you get responses out of people. That's how you get responses out of people. But notice what he says here. He says, I am hoping, second half of verse 22, that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. It's through your prayers, Philemon, that I'm going to have the opportunity to stay with you overnight. Do you guys believe in the power of prayer tonight? I hope so. Because the apostle Paul did. He said, if you don't pray for me to come and visit you and be refreshed by you and to refresh you, if you don't pray to that end, I'm not going to be staying with you. It's through your prayers that I will be ultimately given to you. So please pray. I want to visit you. Your prayers have great power as they are working. And if you don't pray, I might not come. 
The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 2, you have not because you ask not. There are things that God does not do in this universe in a very real sense because we don't pray. Doesn't thwart the plans of God. Don't get that twisted. But if you want to see God move in your life, pray all sorts of prayers and you will see all sorts of answered prayers from God. Your prayers genuinely move mountains and they genuinely make things happen, even down to the hotel room that Paul will be staying in, namely Philemon's own house. Paul says this elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, talking about how he's being persecuted and he's about to die, he feels like. Being pressed down and crushed on every single side and he's asking for the Corinthian church to devote themselves to praying for him. Talking about how God has delivered them and delivered Paul, but in a very strange way. How has God delivered Paul? Well, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he has delivered us, namely Paul and his ministry team. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. In other words, God saved my life through you praying for me. And if you do not continue to pray for me, I might get exterminated. So please keep praying for me as you help me and my ministry team by your prayers. I'll be kept alive, perhaps. And what's the ultimate end result of these prayers? Well, interestingly enough, it's praise from the people of God. When they see these prayer requests answered, and how Paul is being kept alive through their prayer requests, they will instantly result in praise unto God from the Corinthian church. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So getting multiple people together to pray has effectiveness in one sense. If God wants praise through all the people that are praying, he might be pleased to answer the prayers of many. He's not obligated to answer the prayers of many just because many people are praying, but he might be pleased to get praise for himself through the prayers of many. So keep praying and do not lose heart because it works. That's the second thing. Prayer. Finally, Paul's Third confidence booster is the people. Is the people that he surrounded himself with and he's been ministering alongside during his entire earthly ministry. So let's look at the people that he talks about here in verses 23 and 24. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. Epaphras, was probably the person who delivered this letter. And notice what happened to him for taking risks for Jesus Christ and delivering letters from Paul to the church in Colossae. He perhaps got imprisoned for delivering letters and doing other ministry things because the text says that just like the apostle Paul, he was imprisoned for his faith. And you too will be persecuted in Christ Jesus if you live a godly life and take risks for him. But count it all joy, because Paul and Epaphras and Jesus, they went before you. There are two people that I want to take a look at here quickly in this list, namely Mark and Demas, as we close. One of the very first church splits that ever happened in all of church history was the split between the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, his ministry partner, in Acts chapter 15. And this split occurred because they disagreed about the faithfulness of this man named Mark, who's listed in verse 24. They didn't know if they could trust this man named Mark. 
Because earlier on in their missionary journeys, Mark had deserted them and gone back home. The text doesn't exactly say why he deserted them, but many think it's because he got homesick, ministry is difficult, and because he just wanted to go back to familiarity. We don't know. But the point is, Mark deserted Paul. And there's some trust issues there. So the Apostle Paul takes Silas with him and he goes and ministers elsewhere. And Barnabas takes Mark with him and he goes elsewhere and ministers in the surrounding area. But we see, based off of this letter, that they were restored to fellowship later on in their ministry. Restoration in the body of Christ can happen even when difficult splits have happened. You can do fruitful ministry alongside people who have once broken your trust. If you can think of people who have broken your trust and you've lost hope in, keep praying. Keep reaching out. Keep inviting them to youth group. And you might even write letters about them one day, like Paul does here. And the last person I want to talk about here is Demas. This man is mentioned in the book of Colossians as well, at the end when he's writing his final greetings in that book too. So apparently this man, Demas, was helpful to the Apostle Paul throughout his earthly ministry. But we see something infinitely sad happen to Demas near the end of Paul's life. Paul, in writing his last letter to Timothy, called 2 Timothy, in the last chapter of that book, probably the last thing or one of the last things that the Apostle Paul ever wrote concerned this man Demas, who once served him ever so faithfully. And he says this about Demas in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, talking to Timothy, while Paul's in prison here, knowing he's going to die. Do your best to come to me quickly, Timothy, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone off to Thessalonica. This verse is not talking about Demas in the John 3.16 sense, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? This is talking about Demas's sinful love of the world. He loved the fleshly pleasures and experiences that the world could provide him more than he loved almighty God and serving him. He sold his soul for the world. Jesus says that's the most foolish thing you could do in the Gospels. Why sell your soul? Demas loved this present world. The world is very tempting to love. Being liked by people, being accepted by people, being made much of by people, all that is very tempting. And Demas backslid and he fell into that. And he ultimately fell away from the Apostle Paul. So we must be very watchful as we live the Christian life. Am I sinfully loving the things and the institutions of this present age or am I living in light of the next one? Because Demas did not do that. Finally here, Philemon, prayer, and people. Those are the three boosters. But I've got one bonus booster here real quickly. That's in verse 25. Verse 25 says this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. <laughs> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The final booster for Paul and for you in this room tonight is grace. It's grace. 
It's the beginning and the end of this letter. Verse 3, he talks about it. Verse 25, he talks about it. Grace is the beginning of the end of not only this letter, beloved, but it's the beginning and the end of the Christian life. This book is a study of grace. That's all it is. Anything that you get to do is by grace alone, from God alone. The only reason Paul was a Christian was because God showed him grace. The only reason he could be an apostle for God is because God showed him grace. And the only reason you can be in this room tonight following Jesus is because of grace. That's not even the bonus booster. That is the booster under which all the other boosters fall under. That's Philemon. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for this book. Thank you for this story of restoration between Philemon and Paul and Onesimus. And thank you that we too can have confidence in the midst of dire situations because of the grace that you have shown to us and the people that you have surrounded us with and because of the prayers that we get to pray to you. May we not take those realities lightly, Jesus. Help us to live in light of everything that you have so graciously given us. And when situations do seem awkward and tough and difficult, may we know that you have not left us or forsaken us to our own devices, but you have given us sovereign help and sovereign means of grace by which you help us. We praise you for the last five weeks. Praise you for this entire semester. May you be with us as we go into this next month. Youth group lists. May you sustain us in our faith and in our fellowship. May we come back in the month of June ready to hit the ground running. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.